Uh, so I'm super excited to have Tyler Cobble join me on this call. Uh, Tyler and I have actually known each other for a number of years. We actually met on uh, Instagram uh, of all places, and we've stayed in touch over the years. Uh, and, and Tyler's got a fascinating story. He's a broker, but he's also a developer and an investor. Uh, so we're going to try and cover all those topics in today's call. But Tyler, thanks for joining me on this call. Yeah, Chad, thanks for having me on, man. I'm really excited to be on here with you. It's it, it's funny how, yeah, you, you reached out on Instagram a few years ago. And now we're, I mean, we're on the same path, right? Like you had started Instagram when we did. Now we're doing the YouTube channel. You're looking at doing the podcast. It's, it's fun creating all this content in commercial real estate because there's not a whole lot of it out there. So I'm glad we got connected when we did, man. I'm excited to talk today. Yeah, me too. I, I'm really excited to jump into this. So I, I, first thing I want to jump into is, is your experience in Nashville. And I, th I think you're informally known as the, the mayor of East Nashville. So <laughs> want to jump in, get your thoughts first on, on Nashville as a market. I, I think some people will just be fascinated to hear what's going on in, in your neck of the woods. Uh, yeah. And then just your little bit of your background on, on how you earned that unofficial moniker. Yeah, no, I'll take it. I mean, I, uh, I was w among the first wave of commercial real estate agents to start focusing on East Nashville. It was kind of an up and coming side of town. And I really branded myself as the East Nashville commercial real estate group. Um, I was the first Nashville's been small for years, like it just started growing in the last 10. So, you know, if you're going to do commercial real estate in Nashville, you had to do commercial real estate all over Nashville. And by the time that I was coming up in the business, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to focus on a 15 minute radius and I fell in love with the side of town. So, you know, I've lived over here for three years. My offices are over here. Almost all of the projects, except for a couple uh, that we've purchased or acquired have, have all been on this side of town. It's just, to me, it's, it's such a great side of town. So I love spending as much time on this side of the river uh, as I possibly can. Um, but yeah, man, I got started in commercial real estate about seven and a half years ago as a uh, an in-house leasing agent for a boutique development firm. Um, I was with them for about four and a half years, put my own development together while I was there, which was some great experience. My first project was 42 for sale townhomes, and then left in February of 18, started the Cobble Group, um, launched my book, Open for Business, The Insider's Guide to Leasing Commercial Real Estate, like literally within a week, uh, the, the week before I started my firm. And that's when I was like, you know what? I need to go do this thing on my own. I'm already doing everything, so I might as well. So left and uh, started the Cobble Group, which is our commercial real estate brokerage. Uh, grew that and about six months later, had a couple of clients that were 1031 exchanging out of some residential properties into commercial office and, and uh, uh, some shopping centers. And they needed property management. So I'd kind of had a background in that because of the boutique development firm I worked at. I mean, it was all hands on deck there, right? We did office, retail, industrial, multifamily, single family customs, townhomes, you name it. I was involved in it and that included property management. So we, uh, I started the property management company to help my clients because one, it helped solve some cash flow issues for me, mm -hmm. but two, it was a great way to, you know, ensure we got the leasing and to keep everything else going for the brokerage. So they kind of, you know, served each other. About six months after that, started investing in projects on my own. Um, so this was February, 2019. I bought my first office building, which was 6,000 square feet. Uh, ended up buying another three buildings that year. And, and we've been off to the races ever since. So I, I now have a third company, uh, which is called Hamilton. That's the investment and development side of what we are doing. Um, and in the past year, we've acquired about six more properties, add them to the portfolio and are off to the races. We're doing everything from a small uh, six bay car wash uh, conversion into micro restaurants, hmm. um, all the way up to we just acquired 32 acres with a 330,000 square foot shopping center about 15 minutes outside of Nashville for uh, to master plan a heavily mixed high density mixed use development. So a little bit of everything in between. And I know you're documenting this quite extensively on your YouTube channel. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on because it's yeah. fascinating watching your story unfold. But I want to dive a little bit deeper into, into your roots on how you got into the investing side. Uh, because cool. I know the first deal that you did, you actually threw your commissions into it uh, and then also raised a little bit of, bit of money on the side with a couple of your partners. Uh, so I, I, I believe your first deal, you had no money of your own into that, uh, but just, I guess, rolled your commissions into it. So what was the, the journey getting to that stage on, on how you decided you wanted to take a financial risk into buying property? Yeah. Yeah. That first deal, I had no money, man. I mean, I was like 25. I just started my own brokerage. I was just trying to make ends meet. And, uh, but I always knew that I wanted to get in the ownership side of things, right? I mean, that, to me, it was, it was very obvious from day one that if I'm the one that's making 3% on this deal and 
you know, there's monthly cash flow coming in and there's going to be some margins there. Like I'm not the one that's making any money, right? Like I'm making, I'm making everybody else money, which is good, right? Like it's a good first step. It's a good, good way to start and get knowledgeable in the business. Um, but yeah, I knew from, from basically the first year that I wanted to get to the ownership side as quickly as I possibly could. So that first project, uh, it's a, it's a funny story actually. So month, uh, gosh, I guess it was back in, it would have been at the beginning of the summer. I had a client call me and he said, Hey, I want to put a, uh, I want to open up a tech company here in Nashville and I've got the building. Um, will you help us? I said, absolutely. What you got? So he brought the building to us and I looked at it and it was in a neighborhood that I didn't really know very well. Um, it was, uh, it's about 15 minutes outside of Nashville, actually not far from the shopping center that we just purchased in a neighborhood called Old Hickory. And, it, you know, it's a good, solid neighborhood. It's got a nice uh, grid layout, which is really cool. It's right next to the lake. Um, and it's kind of this little pocket. It's, it's called the village at, old, you know, the old, old Hickory Village. And um, I really liked kind of everything that was going on there. But I had not spent a whole lot of time in that area until I started working on this project for this client. So we get into it a, a couple months into the due diligence and he goes, Hey, I can't get my funding together. We're gonna have to pull the plug. And I said, well, you know, it was a $575,000 deal. So I was like, I need the commission. Like, let me go out and find another investor, please. And he was like, that's fine. Go find somebody else. I'll, I'll assign it to him. So I went out and found another investor. We assigned the contract to them and uh, he started doing his, his due diligence. You know, of course, worked with the sellers to extend the time and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then the exact same thing happened. He came to me. He was like, Hey man, I can't get my financing together. Uh, I'm going to have to terminate. And I said, hold on, let me, let me think through this. Give me like a, a week. And, um, I eventually came back to him and I said, look, will you just assign it to me? I'll, I'll do the deal. Because at th by this point, like we had gone through the due diligence. I knew where all of the skeletons were in the project. I knew exactly what had to happen. I've kind of fell in love with the, the neighborhood. And I really liked that it was very neighborhood oriented. Um, you already had a built-in clientele around you, but you didn't have a whole lot of commercial to compete with. So, you know, and it was a $575,000 deal. I was looking at, it, I was like, okay, I've got to raise like $120,000 or put together $120,000. Let's, let's figure that out. So he assigned it to me and I called um, two guys that I'd known for a few years that had been watching me in the business that I'd never asked anything of. Like they just kind of knew what was going on. I'd helped out one of them quite a bit before because he was a developer. The other one was just an investor. And so I called them both and I said, hey, here's kind of what I'm thinking. Here's why I think this is a good deal. And here's how long I want to do it. And I didn't know how to underwrite. I didn't know anything back then. Which is, it's funny how sophisticated we are now. But back then I was just like, Hey, here's what I think we can get. What do you guys think? And uh, they both said yes. So they both gave me $50,000 each. And then I rolled my commission in, which was give or take $18,000. Um, and I think I ended up rolling in maybe another seven. I can't remember exactly how it ended up being, but it was, it was right around 20 or $25,000. Um, but fortunately, I didn't really have to come out of pocket, right? Because I got paid 3% commission on the deal. And that 3% just went straight into my equity portion. I also took an additional 10% for finding the deal and putting it together. So, you know, that 20, we're actually under contract that that project set to close in the next 10 days. Um, so that 20 to $25,000 uh, commission that I rolled in two years ago, I'll get about 70 or $75,000 back in about 10 days. So, I mean, to me, it's a no brainer. Like what, what I take, $25,000 today or $75,000 two years from now, I'm going to take the 75. So it must be a little bittersweet actually having that property under contract because you were probably so emotionally tied to it uh, as, as just getting that foot in the door of uh, investing in commercial real estate to, to let it go. I'm, I'm guessing it's bittersweet. Yeah, it, it really is because that was the building that triggered it all, right? Like I was, all, I was so scared of investing before that. Because it's, you know, it's a big deal. You're taking on people's capital. Like if something messes up, it's on you. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's not something to take lightly. And, um, you know, I, I mean, there were plenty of sleepless nights making sure I was making the right, you know, am I making the right decision or, or am I going to lose these guys money? Like how will I pay them back if I, if I do, you know, what, what are we going to do? Um, but I knew like, look, uh, you know, if I'm going to bet on any horse, I'm the best horse to be betting on because I know that I'm going to figure out a way to make it happen. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it, it was very emotional because, uh, that building triggered it, right? Like I didn't own any property. I'd done the development. The, the minute that I bought that property, I was like, oh, wow, I can do this. This is actually really like, it's not easy, but like, it's not rocket science. 
So I bought three more buildings that year. <laughs> so you think about like just how that snowballed. Um, and then and it's funny, like I thought I was going to hold on to that building forever. And uh, it eventually became this one of the smallest properties in my portfolio. And it's uh, the furthest away outside of my investment in Chattanooga, which is two and a half hours away. It's a little bit different, uh, but it's the furthest away from me in Nashville. So it's like, man, you know, this is kind of a lifestyle business. I don't, I don't want to drive more than 15 minutes anywhere. So, you know, uh, we decided to sell it. And, for, and I had approached the tenant uh, in the building. And I just said, hey, look, I'm, I'm considering selling it. Uh, you know, I think you guys would be the best buyer. Y'all should de you know, definitely own your own real estate. And so they, they agreed. So they're buying it. So you, you bring up a couple of really fascinating points that I want to expand on. Uh, so the first being you had to convince those two investors that you were the right guy to spearhead this and manage the property. And whether it's convincing investors or convincing a lender, that that's something that you have to do. But you run into that catch 22 where you have to show that you have the experience to do it. But until you actually have that experience, it's very, very difficult to actually prove it. So right. the, the second point uh, is you started with a small property. And I did this similar, the first investment property that I bought. Uh, I, I bought it with a, a partner of mine. We each put about 30 grand into it. Uh, it was a small industrial condo. Uh, and we actually still own that condo. That was six or seven years ago now. Uh, bought and sold a handful of other properties since, but we still have that first industrial condo. Uh, but that was really a springboard to allow us to do more. Uh, we had bought and sold a couple more before we did a, a formal raise uh, to, to get outside capital. But it, yep. it's difficult to actually get that that experience and that confidence. And I think that's what a lot of beginner investors really struggle with is they've got to either convince uh, investors or they have to convince a lender to give them money and it's difficult to do. So how, how do you recommend to people when, when they want to get into that first one, you already had a commercial real estate background. Uh, so that obviously gave you some credibility. What do you say to people that want to get into commercial real estate and they either have to raise money or convince a lender, uh, that they're capable of managing it? Yeah. I mean, look, I'd been in the business for five years at that point. Right. So I had the track record. Um, I had good relationships with people. And I'd been kind of building those relationships for a while. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the two guys that I called, I'd never asked them for anything. They knew exactly what I was doing. They had seen my track record. So, you know, I made the first capital raise as easy on myself as possible, right? I, I didn't go out and try and raise $2 million right off the bat because I'll tell you, like, even though we're successful now, I mean, I don't have somebody on the team that's full-time raising capital. Every time we go through a project, we're about to go through one right now where we have to put together 3.2 million. And that's going to be a lot. That's going to take a lot. Like it's, it's not easy putting that capital together. So the easier you can make it on yourself um, to go do that, I'd, I'd say start in that hundred dollars to $200,000 range because you can go to eight people and get $25,000 from them each. And it's not, it's not a huge ask, right? Like you'd be amazed at how many people have $25,000 laying around that they would like to invest. So um, I think that I think that's the thing starting out. It's just make it easier on yourself. Um, start small, um, and then you know just consider your track record, right? Because everybody, you know, especially it's your first deal. Um, you know, a lot of these investors want to know what you've done before, and they need to know that you know, hey, you know, there's nothing wrong with you saying, hey, look, this is my first deal, but here's why you should invest with me, because mm -hmm. um, everybody's got to start somewhere. Yeah. And I'd piggyback on that comment because I think that is the, the most important thing is that people need to realize, especially with commercial real estate, it's perhaps different on the residential side where you might be able to do a quick flip and, and get in and out uh, relatively quickly. Commercial real estate is a really long game. Like it can take several years, if not decades before you actually manifest the opportunity to, to make a return on it. So it's a yep. long-term horizon where people have to be incredibly patient to get into it. Uh, I think the rewards are immense. I've, I've, I've done well. I know you've been very successful in it, but it is a patience game where you, you took five years before you're even comfortable buying your first property and you had that track record. So it, it definitely takes time on that. Uh, what are you looking for when, when you're doing your, your investment, whether you're just in the preliminary stage doing like the back of the envelope math or whether you're going through a full underwriting how do you determine what's what's a viable investment for your portfolio yeah i mean one if it's in my neighborhood if it's in east nashville we'll definitely consider it you know we'll find a way to make it work if we possibly can because i believe in what's going on the side of the of, of town and also we're going to be here for the next 10 15 20 30 plus years right so you know we could overpay for something today 
and in two years we'll be totally fine. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, of course we don't want to do that, but you know, if there, if I can see what the upside potential is, like I don't really buy anything that's stabilized. It doesn't make sense to me a lot of the time because we make our money doing a value add project. So I do mostly heavy value add and development, um, which have better returns, but they're obviously on the more risky side of the investments. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think I'm, we're, we're open to considering just about anything. I mean, right now, you know, we're about to go live with a boutique hotel. We are doing a multifamily slash office tower in Chattanooga. We're doing a mixed use master plan development in Madison. We're doing a uh, commercial, you know, project uh, development over off of Dickers and Pike in East Nashville for, with a focus on micro units, you know, like 150 to thousand square foot units, office, retail, uh, and restaurant. So, you know, it, I'm willing to kind of consider anything as long as I think it'll be a good return. So let's, let's look into that a little bit more. Cause I'm curious to see how you evaluate those. So when you're looking at a property that is a, val- a true value add property and you're looking at it at a price that you can acquire it at, how are you running your metrics for what that extra strategy looks like, or whether it's a refinance or selling it down the road? Is it, projections based on what kind of lift you can get on the on the rental rates and then you capitalize that at a going out cap rate or is it just getting the per square foot value of the building up uh, and hoping that the rates come down the road how, how do you forecast out what the what the future is on those value add projects yeah i mean it's it's really tough um you know if i had a, if i had a crystal ball then we'd, <laughs> we'd all be a lot richer um but i you know it, it's a good point so all underwriting is, is a, a, an educated guess into what the future will be, right? I mean, nobody can underwrite a project and tell you with certainty that this is how it's going to be. You don't know, right? So we look at historical data and go, okay, well, over the past five years, you know, rental rates in Nashville have increased 3% a year. Okay, well, then that's what we're going to use as our 3% rental increase for the next five years, right? Because we have historical data showing that. Um, same with uh, rental rates. We'll start it off at today's rental rate and you know, hope that it goes up 3% a year. Um, we look at vacancies and again, look at historic vacancies. We look at historic operating expenses. And then we just add in our projections as to, okay, well, how long do we think it's going to take to get leased up? How much money are we going to have to put it in there? What will be the new rental rates when we've got that going? Uh, how long will it take us to stabilize the project? Um, I mean, we have a, a pretty in-depth underwriting process now. I've got two guys on my team that really oversee that side of it because it's that important, um, doing all the research and all the data and analytics. But, uh, you know, it, it, uh, when we come to the exit, it's always based on a cap rate. I don't even look at the price per square foot of a building because to me in commercial, unless you're buying something totally vacant, the price per square foot doesn't really matter. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you'll see projects trade for, $800 a foot in Nashville and it costs, you know, $250 or $300 a foot to build. And you're like, well, how do they justify paying 800 a foot for it? Well, it's because it's sold on a cap rate, right? You're selling it based on the income that it produces and not necessarily the, the value of the square footage. So, uh, but yeah, we base everything off of cap rates, future values. Uh, so going back to that uh, comment uh, about how development and the value that you guys are doing has more potential for upside, what, the opposite of that is you've got more downside risk. Uh, so how, how are you forecasting to protect that downside risk so you don't get burned too bad? Or is it just one of those things you believe in your process and you're prepared to stay in the pocket as long as you have to until you get the desired outcome? Yeah, I mean, I believe in myself and the team, you know, kind of like I said earlier, if I'm going to bet on a horse, I'm going to bet on myself because I know that I'm the best one to bet on. Um, you know, it really comes down to how familiar are we with this product? how how confident are we that there's demand for it and can we pull this off i mean if it's something that we've never done before then we'll probably tone it back a little bit and i always make sure to talk to advisors i talk to lenders i talk to equity groups i mean if if it's always good to get more eyes on a deal because everybody's going to have a different perspective right the lender is your partner in the project right i mean they're your partner right they're putting up the largest chunk of capital for the, for the deal. So if a lender is not seeing it, there's a reason why. So it's, it's good to have a conversation with them to figure, okay, well, why, why are you not interested in this project? Oh, it's because of, you know, hotel occupancies or whatever it ends up being. Well, then we can have that discussion and sharpen our pencil a little bit to make sure that we're making the most educated guess. Um, 
So yeah, and, and it's it's kind of a combination of you know our experience watching what's going on in the market and projecting where we're going to be in the next three to five years. You know, Nashville fortunately is growing at an unbelievable pace. We keep having you know record breaking job announcements. I mean, Oracle just announced eighty five hundred jobs in East Nashville and River North, and so you look at that and it's like okay, well. You know, a boutique hotel in East Nashville is probably going to do really well because there's going to be a lot of executives coming into town that want to stay there. And also, you know, there's there's a whole bunch of bachelorettes that are staying in, in Broadway, which is 10 minutes from this hotel site. But all the hotel offerings are they're really um, more like, you know, vertical hotels. Well, this one's all single story kind of have your own suite and it's kind of like a campus. So we look at, you know, okay, well, why would that be differentiated from something else? What kind of experiences could we provide that nobody else is providing? It's, it's kind of, it's, it's really a, a gosh, there's so much that goes into every single project. Um, but there's, there's millions of points, right? Well, and two points that I've heard you mention before, which I want to touch on because I think they're really profound uh, is the first, if you are a let's call it a small to medium sized investor, not not institutional or big corporation, but a small medium sized investor. One thing that you've recommended before is to have a property that you can drive by every day. Uh, and I think that that's like a really wise thing. Uh, because unless you're a big company that that can have boots on the ground that can manage it, if you've got your own capital in there, having a property that you can see every day is is really important. So that, that's definitely one that that, that I've really uh, liked that you've talked about. And the second, and you've touched on that as well uh, today is having a good team. You've mentioned before that you've got your lawyer involved right from the beginning, potentially even multiple lawyers if you're doing a syndication. But you, you're doing that right up front. You're not trying to uh, shoehorn a deal just to make it fit. You're making sure that you're going through the whole due diligence package on that. So I, I think that that's really important. Uh, what, what's been your experience with some of the, because you said you had a property that's a couple hours away. Uh, I'm guessing you bought that one after you've already had some familiarity with with your local market. Has there been a big difference between the one that you could drive by and even work out of one of your investments? Uh, what's the difference like having one a couple hours away? Yeah, I mean, look, that project is going to get less attention than the ones I'm driving by every day. It doesn't mean that it's it's not going to be paid attention to, right? I mean, we're, we're working on it every day. Uh, we're just not there every day. So, you know, it's which it is, it, that makes it tougher. But once we hit critical mass in that city, then I will have a team there. Mm -hmm. um, which will make it that much easier. So, you know, in that tower, I'm going to be building out an office uh, for my team. And so now we're, we're down there about once every couple of weeks. Once we start construction and renovations, we'll probably be down there every week. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, you know, we're going through that kind of pre-com process right now. But yeah, I mean, I think now that I've got a team and everybody can be, you know, working on some sort of aspect uh, from every different angle, it's a lot easier for us to have a project out of market. I mean, if I was doing all of this on my own, there's not, not a chance could I take on a project in Chattanooga. Um, it, just, it just wouldn't work out really well because I'd be, I, I, would, I would have to personally spend so much time in Chattanooga that I wouldn't be paying attention to other stuff here in Nashville, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it becomes a balancing act. I think having a, a solid team is incredibly important. I mean, look, real estate is a team game. Anybody that thinks that they can come out here and do all of this on their own is just wrong or uh, they will they will never reach their full potential. Um, you know, I, I would rather have a smaller slice of an exponentially larger pie than to have 100% of the pie. That's just how it is, right? Like, I mean, if I was waiting to um, start investing in commercial real estate when I had enough money to fully fund a project myself, it would have taken me probably another year or two longer, right? And then I, I just, it would have taken forever. Well, I've acquired like seven or eight properties since then. And so, you know, now it's one that's helped me build an immense amount of wealth, but two, those projects fund the cobble group, right? Like my brokerage, like that becomes leasing assignments for them. It funds my property management company because those become management assignments. It becomes, you know, we, we get development fees off of doing the projects. So, everything just starts to snowball and you get this, um, you get a synergy that you just wouldn't have if you were trying to slowly build up one by one. I think it just, I think it takes too long. So it really is a team sport. And also, you know, my strengths, I also have weaknesses that I, I bring in partners to help compliment me on. Like Bruce Peterson and I partner on a lot of deals because he and his wife handle the back end, the administration, the, the uh, dealing with the K-1s and the tax returns and investor relations. 
because that's not my skill set. My skill set is going out and finding the deal, putting it together and operating it. Right. And so it's very complimentary. If you don't have both, you're going to be in trouble. Yeah, it's really profound. And I, I think if there's, if a new investor would take one thing away from it is, is to humbly recognize that you do have weaknesses. Uh, collectively, we all have weaknesses that yeah. they're just blind spots that we might not even know our weaknesses. So it's, it's imperative that you're at least recognizing that you could have those, those blind spots and try and fill it out. Uh, whether it's by bringing in a capital partner, or whether it's just by hiring that outside expertise engineer, architect, lawyer, broker, uh, just recognizing that you can't do it all as a gunslinging cowboy uh, is a really important step to uh, to avoiding a lot of those mistakes down the road. So uh, that's, a, that's a really good point on that. Uh, as you continue to grow, do you see that model continuing where you're going to do outside capital raises? Or does it shift at some point where you do try to be the main capital uh, investor in those projects? No, I think it's uh, I think it's a terrible use of my capital to be the biggest investor in all of our projects. Um, of course, I always invest alongside my investors. I at least put the minimum in, mm -hmm. right? Because I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. I mean, not only am I signing on the debt, but I'm also going to invest alongside you. Like this isn't just a hey, you put up all the money and take all the risk, and I'll just be here to make money. No, so I mean, um, that being said, like you know, my capital gets used for pursuing the next deal. Right. Like that's that's what it's there for is let's let's go find the next project and and keep this rolling. So, um, no, I think we'll always be raising capital. So, uh, you know, that's that's something that we are constantly doing. I'm constantly on phone calls. I'm constantly in meetings trying to, you know, meet with people who are looking to invest 25, 50, 100,000, a million dollars. It doesn't matter. I want to talk to you um, because we, we can deploy that into real estate. And there's a lot of people out there that want to find these deals that don't have the opportunity because they're not the they can't go find them right it's like think about it, if you're a doctor you're making half a million dollars a year you have plenty to invest but you don't really have the time to go out and find the deal put it together operate it deal with all that kind of stuff you just want to place the capital and know that it's being taken care of so you know it's it's really a partnership there i think um you know it's it's a good opportunity for investors to get involved in real estate without having to really do much else so you know, at some point, will we start talking to private equity firms and, and, and other types of, of institutional capital? Sure. Um, I, I think we will get to that point. But for the time being, we're just doing friends and family raises. Um, sometimes we'll do an accredited investor only raise, which means, you, you know, you have to be an accredited investor in order to be in that project. I prefer friends and family, uh, just because, you know, if we have a pre existing relationship, you can be involved in the deal without having to be an accredited investor, which there are plenty of people that are making $150,000 a year and have a lot of money saved up that aren't technically accredited investors. So it's tough for them to get in those projects. So the one thing that I just want to expand on a little bit as well is uh, how you go into the analogy of the doctor who has, has a really good income and he's got money to invest. Not only do they not have the time and, and energy available to actually go and source a deal and manage it, but they also just don't have your local expertise by being in the industry, the information that you have by being so close to it on knowing what deals are coming up, uh, what what's happening in the market, major trends, that, that's a skill set that's heavily underrated, because th that can often be the difference between making a right decision, uh, and making a decision that that backfires. So I, I think you, your local market expertise is, is critical in, in delivering those returns so that people not only make a make a return on it, but recommend you and and go into other projects so I, well, that's exactly right and it, and it also it goes both ways right like i'm not going to go jump into the medical field and start <laughs> investing in medical tech or you know medical property like you know i mean obviously properties i would understand but like you know medical innovation or whatever like i don't really know what i'm looking at i don't know if this you know spinal implant is going to be the next thing right so like i would go find an expert in that if i'm really interested in investing in medical i would go find somebody that i could talk to and invest with that you know could hopefully explain to me why this is good, right? So it, go, it goes both ways. It's, it's always about finding that expert in their field. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe that's a good segue because I, I do want to talk about Nashville's market because it, like you said, it's growing. You guys are adding a ton of jobs. There's a pretty big spotlight on Nashville in general right now. So I, I guess a couple part question, what's happening 
Nashville from more of a macro level. Uh, and then I, I want to get your thoughts on just the office market as well, because I know you guys are heavily invested in office. Uh, so we could dive into what that looks like on a, on a work from home or whether people return at the office. But I guess first thing, uh, what's, what's Nashville? What's happened in Nashville in the past year? Yeah, I mean, Nashville is just absolutely taking off, right? It's, so it's a, it's a blue city within a red state which is always very attractive. So you look at the other, you know, big blue cities and red states. I mean, Austin, Texas, um, you know, Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. If you, if you look at the ULI top three, it's Raleigh, Durham, number one, Austin, number two, and Nashville, number three um, in, their, in their emerging trends list, right? I mean, those are the top three cities to invest in this year. And uh, Nashville just has so much going for it. I mean, if you look at where it is located geographically um, in a two hour drive, I can be in, uh, well, four hours, I can be in Atlanta. Um, you know, four hours, I can be up into Cincinnati, Ohio. Six hours, I'm in Chicago. Um, you know, it's so well, it's, it's, so, it's so very accessible because all the interstates run through Nashville. Mm -hmm. So within about a day's drive, you can reach 80% of the country's population. So you think about that from a from a logistics perspective. If you're, if you're Amazon, which is why they keep opening up warehouses here, if you're Amazon and you need a very well located uh, warehouse so that you can ship things, you know, either to Atlanta or to Austin, Texas, you know, overnight, I mean, you're going to pick Nashville. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're going to. So there's a lot of that going on. Nashville has a great culture, right? It's, it's really cool. You get that progressive thinking city with that Southern attitude. So, you know, it's very hospitable. Um, you know, people hold the door open for each other. It's, it's really nice, but it's also a very progressive city. We have a very well balanced economy. So there's a lot of education. There's a lot of health. Uh, we have a very rapid, you know, rapidly growing tech sector um, as you know, with, with Amazon moving here, with Oracle moving here. Um, and we've also got a, a, a growing financial sector, right? Alliance Bernstein moved here off of Wall Street a couple of years ago. So uh, that's, a, that's pretty big. Now, of course, we've got tourism. I mean, tourism in Nashville is number one. It's huge pays for over 50% of our state income or of, of our uh, city income tax because um, of all the money that gets spent down there. So, you know, not to mention the fact that uh, Tennessee doesn't have a state income tax. So if you're moving here from California or Chicago or New York, any of those other states that were shut down during COVID and still have not recovered because they are still shut down, you're going to move to Nashville and reopen your business here because it's got a very similar, you know, it's got a great culture. Uh, and it's a very business friendly environment. So that's what's going on in Nashville. It's kind of the perfect storm um, for not only millennials, you know, trying to decide where they want to live their lives, but also for businesses. Hmm. So on the office front, uh, lots of companies are, are moving there. What, what have you seen in the past year? Is there still that big trend of working from home or are people going back into the office now? Yeah, I mean, look, we've we've got a pretty decent uh, amount of office in our portfolio and we collected hundred percent of rents um, throughout the, throughout the pandemic. So um, we haven't had a lot of turnover. People are staying in their office space. You know, we, we fortunately work mostly with local small businesses. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we don't have any class A office space and those are largely the groups that are going to have HR send everybody home because they're not comfortable with the level of risk. Right. I mean, I, I haven't stopped coming into the office. Most of my tenants never stopped coming into the office. So it's, it just, it did well. I think, I think for big corporations, um, work from home will become an option and maybe it'll be, you know, you're in the office three days a week and two days a week, you can work from home. Uh, but I don't see work from home becoming a permanent solution. It doesn't make any sense because as soon, like, of course, everybody says that now, right. And back, you know, six months ago when they were surveying everybody, everybody said, no, we're only going to do this. Well, think about the mental stress and duress that everybody was under when they were responding to those surveys, right? Like they're thinking this is, you know, could be the end of the world. Um, and so you're going to have everybody work from home. Well, as soon as it's cleared and everybody can start working in the office again and teams can start working together and you can hang out with each other and build that camaraderie and all the synergy that comes from being able to just walk down the hallway and ask somebody in accounting what their thoughts are on something in marketing, I mean, it's just, it's so much easier than having to do a Zoom call for every little thing. Um, you know, the, people are fatigued of Zoom. They just are. It's, it, it can be miserable sometimes, you know, and I feel like we got to a point there too, where conference calls were turned into Zoom calls, which is like, man, why, why do we need to turn a conference call into a Zoom call? Y'all don't need to see me in order for us to have this conversation. Um, so I, I think 
as soon as everything is lifted, you're going to see the majority of companies go back to the office. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and kind of my thoughts on that is I, I think that the, it's a very oversimplification, but I think that there's two groups. There's one group that genuinely wants to go back to the office, whether they just feel of that collaboration and the, the environment there is a lot more conducive for it. Uh, and then there's a second group that just does not want to go back to the office. Maybe they hate the commute or they just hate people, uh, whatever it is, they yeah. just don't want to go back. Uh, to, to that latter group, I think that there's a huge risk with not going back to the office uh, because I think you become a lot more expendable if the only interaction you have with your employer yeah. is over a virtual call. I think if a, if a company had to lay someone off or if they wanted to go in a different direction and ax a whole department, it's going to be a lot easier if the employee that they've been dealing with has all been virtual. So I think that there's a considerable risk for the people that don't want to go back. And I think that there's a lost opportunity where it's going to be very hard to get promoted uh, to advance in your company if you're only doing virtual calls. So I, I, I th it's far too early to say that all those people aren't going to go back to the office because I think as things get back to normal, you're just going to see the people that are in person are going to advance much quicker. I think they're going to have a, ha a better job satisfaction and they're going to have a better rapport with their colleagues and their, their supervisors and employers. So I, I agree with you. I, I think that there will, there'll be some faction of the workforce that, that is allowed to do a hybrid. Uh, but I, I'd be, I'd be skeptical that this is going to be a systemic issue that goes forward. Cause I, I just think that there's, there's so much to gain by actually physically being in an office. Uh, exactly. So I, I share a lot of your, your comments on that. Uh, last thing I wanted to talk, talk about, and, and, and I'm sensitive to our time here, uh, but I, I really want to, to get your thoughts on your YouTube journey because uh, uh, we've known each other for a while and your, your channel uh, is still relatively new. You're, you're about a year into it, but you've had crazy growth uh, on the sole foundation that you're just giving a, a lot of value. Like you're, you're not going on and just walking with your phone through a property and, and pointing out some of the, of the details. You're, you're really given a ton of value on that. So what's, what's been your, your journey to get to where it is right now? And, and what does the future hold for your channel? Yeah, man. So when COVID hit, I mean, I went from 100% of my time outside of the office to 100% of my time in the office trying to figure out what to do because everybody put everything on pause. And so it was great because it gave me the opportunity to start focusing on everything that we'd been thinking of doing for a long time. And YouTube was one of those. So I really started off with the blog. Um, we'd been blogging for a couple of years at that point, but nothing really seriously. Mm -hmm. um, I started taking it seriously. I started writing, you know, two to three posts a week because I just wanted to, you know, keep relevant somehow. And that took off. I mean, our website is one of the top ranking websites now um, for commercial real estate, which is crazy just because we consistently write the, and produce that content, um, which is really cool to see. And then um, I just started taking those blog posts and turning them into scripts for videos uh, so that we, you know, it made it very easy. Right before the pandemic hit, I actually hired a graphics, um, a motion graphics and, and you know, AV guy. Um, and I was trying to, you know, I kind of hired him ahead of when I thought I was going to need him because I was like, oh, well, you know, let's figure out how we're going to do this. As soon as COVID hit, it's like, okay, cool. We're making videos full time. Like there's nothing else to do. So we started releasing a video a week, um, started off with a more educational side of things. So just, you know, what does triple net mean? What, you know, uh, how to raise capital for commercial real estate. So it kind of started off as that. And then in the last couple of months, we've added in live streaming. So on Mondays at 5.30 PM, we live stream uh, commercial real estate news. We're the only commercial real estate news show that's coming out weekly. Um, Tuesdays, we're, we're doing a, an interview or talking about some sort of topic. Andy and I, who Andy's my asset manager, um, 5.30 PM central. And then 5.30 on Wednesdays, we're also doing, we're doing a live underwriting. So we go find a deal that's still available. If you want to buy it, you can buy it, but we go through the process of underwriting it. So people can kind of understand how we look at that and approach it. Thursdays, we've got the educational videos going out. And then Fridays, I've got a vlog. So I do have two full-time guys on it. Um, it has been, I mean, we're investing a lot of money into that content. So I'm definitely not anywhere close to even breaking even, uh, at this point, but it's my marketing budget, right? Like I don't spend money on anything else. I'm not putting, you know, uh, magazine ads out. We're not running commercials. I mean, to me, that's our marketing. Um, and it's working. I've got people from across the country calling and asking to invest in our deals. I've got 
tenants calling, you know, looking for space and, um, you know, potential coaching and uh, coaching clients calling, asking me to, to kind of coach them through their first deal. So um, that's really how it's kind of paying for itself. But yeah, we started back in April, I, don't know, I guess April 15th of last year, give or take. And we're at about 2,700, almost 2,800 subscribers at this point. And I've noticed that it's starting to kind of, you know, grow exponentially. It took, I guess, from April to December to hit a thousand. And since December, we've grown to 27, 2800. So it's definitely picking up steam. It's, it's just a lot of, uh, it's a lot of work, man. We're putting a lot of work into it every week. And, uh, you know, you just got to keep putting that content out there. Yeah, well, as, as a subscriber of your guys' channel, just a fan of you in general, I, I think the thing that I admire the most is that it's the perfect combination of informative and entertaining, uh, which yeah. is very rare to do uh, in the commercial real estate space, because I'm sure you've looked uh, looked around as well. Like, There's just very little for good quality commercial real estate content on, on YouTube. So I, I commend you guys for, for doing that. As I, I can tell the amount of time and effort you guys are putting into it, because it is a finely polished product that you're putting out. Yeah, thanks, man. I really appreciate that. And likewise, I mean, I'm loving your stuff on industrial. Keep it coming, man, because there's just there's no content like that out there. That's the crazy thing. I mean, when I first got started in this business, it was so frustrating trying to learn anything. I mean, think about that. Seven and a half years ago, what were you going to do? There were like two podcasts out. It was like Michael Bull's uh, America's Commercial Real Estate Show. And um, there was one other one. I can't remember what it was. But like that was it. Um, and so I listened to every podcast or read every book that I could, which of course there's only like four or five, like actual good books on commercial real estate. And then other than that, you just had to learn on the job. And so I'm trying to, to, to peel back, um, you know, the, the covers and, and, uh, really show everybody, you know, that it's, it's not as complicated as it, as it, as everybody thinks it is. Uh, it's just that people don't talk about it. So yeah. Uh, well, I'll leave a, a link to your YouTube channel in the description as well. And I'd encourage anyone to go check you out because you do put out a great product. So I uh, really appreciate you uh, jumping on this call with me and I uh, hope to keep in touch down the road here as well. Chad, thanks for having me, man. Good luck on your channel. Thanks, Tyler. You too.